And I welcome everybody here today. It's uh, great to see so many people participating in this event. Uh, we're particularly delighted to be joined by Peter Altmaier, who's the former Federal Minister for Economic Affairs and Energy, and many things as well, one of the most experienced German politicians of his generation. He'll speak to us for about 20 minutes, and then we we'll move into a discussion with the audience. Uh, all of this will be on the record. Uh, in putting your questions, please use the question and answer function. And I would encourage you to put your questions in as soon as possible. I suspect they'll cover a lot of ground and it would be helpful for the discussion if I was able to group them a bit. So if you could cooperate in that, it would be very helpful. Uh, and if you want to Twitter, uh, you want to tweet, use the hashtag IIEA. Um, so now I will formally introduce Peter Altmaier. As I say, one of the most experienced politicians of his generation. He's been a leading politician for more than two decades. He was a wholehearted supporter of Chancellor Merkel and was involved therefore in most of the crucial and controversial political decisions in the EU and Germany during her tenure as Chancellor. He served as Federal Minister for Economic Affairs and Energy, Acting Minister of Finance, Minister in the Chancellery, Minister of the Environment. He was Chief Whip and began his political career as State Secretary in the Ministry of the Interior. By uh, profession, he's a lawyer, and before becoming a member of the Bundestag, he was actually a functionary in the European Commission. So I'm going to hand over to him, and we look forward very much to what you have to say to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, for this kind introduction. Uh, thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, uh, when I was um, uh, contacted via email by um, Emily Vinci, um, some days even after my, um, uh, the end of my political career, I gladly um, uh, and immediately accepted the invitation. Um, and um, because I have such a long standing um, relationship with Ireland, uh, it all began more than 1,000 years ago. Um, I don't know, um, Holy Orana, um, she uh, has been an Irish woman and she has uh, brought uh, us to Christianity. She made us uh, Catholic um, uh, beings uh, uh, in uh, the eighth century uh, after Christ. Um, her remains um, uh, are buried in my constituency and I have even hosted a group of EU Commission civil servants from Ireland traveling to St. Orana uh, in my constituency. Uh, I met, um, I met, um, I worked for an Irish commissioner, Patrick Flynn, when I served as a civil servant in the European Commission, not in his cabinet, but in one of his uh, directorates. Um, I met with John Bruton in 1994 when he was, uh, when he was uh, a Taoiseach. Uh, and later on in the European Convention, where we drafted uh, a European uh, constitution. Um, I um, uh, met with Enda Kenny when he was an opposition leader, Leo Varadkar, even recently when he was the Minister of Trade and um, I was dealing with trade as well in my capacity uh, in the last uh, government of Angela Merkel. Phil Hogan uh, was a counterpart when he was a minister uh, of the environment uh, and uh, during the Irish presidency, he organized for us a guided tour uh, in the Guinness uh, Brewery in Dublin that was unforgettable. Um, and later we worked uh, together as well as uh, Pascal Donegal, uh, who is now the president of the Euro group. Um, and I must say that over all these years, when it comes to European policy, uh, making um, the, the Irish have never been the problem. They have always been part of the solution. And that is something that has impressed me um, very much. Uh, and I have a personal, a personal souvenir of your institute uh, because I was uh, an invited guest speaker when I worked in the convention or when I was a parliamentary state secretary. I do not remember the date. It is between 15 and 20 years ago, uh, but I still remember the venue, it was uh, very distinguished uh, and it was a lovely atmosphere. Um, today, you have chosen um, a title for um, uh, our discussion that couldn't be uh, more precise. 
um, when we make, uh, when we do a rational analysis of the uh, European Union's tasks and challenges, I think everybody will agree that in its 70 years long history, the European Union has never ever uh, seen such enormous, multiple and unprecedented challenges than uh, today. It all started in 2008, 2009 with the banking crisis that we have, um, that we have um, um, controlled but um, not um, uh, uh, brought to, to an end for all times. That's not possible. It continued with the uh, sovereign debt and euro crisis, uh, where Ireland uh, was doing a great, great job uh, taking difficult uh, decisions. We are all facing for um, th three decades uh, at least a climate crisis that is the biggest threat for the younger generation um, and the planet. Um, we are facing a technological uh, transformation. That's not new, but it is in a way disruptive as it has never been uh, before. Uh, when you, when it, let's look at, at a German car, uh, upper class car produced, manufactured in Germany. Um, we will still have cars in 10 or 20 years time, but uh, different gadgets. Uh, no combustion engine anymore, uh, electricity instead of, um, uh, of um, um, fossil uh, fuel. Uh, we will have artificial intelligence, autonomous driving, um, and many other innovations that are going to change the world. It is not just um, IT and um, digital revolution. Um, it is biotech. Um, it is um, um, uh, all that is uh, related uh, to the um, disruptive um, um, the tendencies um, in Europe and in the world. And the question is, who is going to lead this revolution? Uh, Germany, my country, as a country of engineers, uh, was used uh, for almost uh, 120 years uh, to play a leading role in all these innovation processes. It was the first time when microprocessors were invented we lost that role. Uh, and today, most of the innovations are being done in the US, uh, in China, and elsewhere uh, in Asia. And this uh, technological um, uh, innovation uh, can lead to a geographical disruptive transformation. Uh, when I was uh, a student um, uh, 40 years ago, um, the uh, economic world consisted merely uh, of the United States, Europe, and Japan. Uh, and then we saw the um, uh, emerging power of uh, South Korea. Today, China, that was seen as a developing country 40 years ago, has become one of the most innovative, uh, highly technology-oriented oriented, uh, countries uh, with rapid economic growth. Um, and uh, the question is, who is going to be the leading economic and financial center of the civilized world in 20, 30 years from now. It is decided right now, not uh, in a um, um, uh, long-term um, uh, future. And in the middle of all the challenges, now we had the COVID-19 and we have this terrible war in Ukraine. This Russian aggression, this uh, war that um, uh, comes from Russia, from its president uh, Putin, um, and that um, has uh, brought so much um, uh, misery, uh, so much violence, uh, so much destruction to this uh, innocent uh, country that no one was able uh, to imagine. Of course, uh, we all have seen uh, the um, annexation, uh, the illegal annexation of Crimea uh, eight years ago. We all have seen the um, uh, war in the Donbas uh, the same year. Uh, and we knew that uh, Russia would um, um, possibly not tolerate enlargement of uh, NATO by Ukraine. But nobody could imagine a hot war under such cruel, inhuman conditions. Uh, that we are seeing now. And I think 
that uh, one lesson uh, that we should have learned is um, in, some, in such under such circumstances, um, solidarity with Ukraine is key. I'm not interfering with my governments or the European unions or NATO uh, uh, politics. That is not my role being a political pensioner for four months now already. Uh, no, my uh, role is, uh, however, to, 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 to appeal to public opinion, to, to work behind the curtains um, in a way um, that we all realize uh, that people in Ukraine who knew, who know that we would never enter a war uh, when um, uh, an, a non-NATO country is uh, involved, uh, but that people in Ukraine know that they can rely on us as far as humanitarian help is concerned, as far as uh, reconstruction after the war is concerned, and of course, as far as solidarity is concerned, as far as the export of weapons uh, is concerned. I know there are lots of debates on details. Um, and as I said, I cannot interfere, but it is an important issue and we have to spend perhaps, uh, and that is what I'm afraid of um, for some weeks, perhaps even months, a uh, lot of attention, uh, how we can make uh, life a little bit easier for the poor country uh, that suffers uh, so uh, enormously. And then the next question, the next question is, um, what is, um, why did this happen in our time? Why did this um, most cruel war occur in Europe since the end of the Second World War? Would we have had the chance to avoid it? And what was the mistake that was made? I think that will be debated by institutes like yours uh, when the war is over. Uh, I think now we have more urgent things, but um, I can tell you there was a debate about it. When Crimea was annexed, we have adopted sanctions. We have stopped uh, exporting um, uh, weapons to Russia. Um, France had um, uh, built two aircraft carriers for Russia. They were already paid. They were never delivered to them. We have um, expelled Russia from G8, became G7. We have uh, decided as European Union economic sanctions, perhaps not severe enough. Yes, that is something we will have to discuss. But I can tell you, as somebody who was, uh, of course, uh, uh, in, in dialogue with the um, representatives of the European, not, not just the German, but the European um, uh, private sector all the time. There were a lot of complaints why these sanctions were not lifted. And we always have argued they will be lifted as soon as the illegal situation with regard of Crimea has come to an end and as soon um, as uh, people in the Donbass um, uh, can be uh, uh, integral part of Ukraine uh, again. Uh, we have neg negotiated the Minsk uh, agreement, uh, France, Germany, uh, Ukraine, and Russia, uh, the so-called Normandy format, because um, under President Obama, our American friends did not want to be involved in the crisis. But this Minsk agreement was never uh, respected, not by Russia. It was not uh, transposed um, by the two sides. Um, and the question is, have we become a little bit too, um, too much taken by COVID-19, by Euro crisis and other uh, events? Why did we not insist on major initiatives over the last couple of years? And the next question is, what are we going to do? Uh, and in the 20 minutes um, uh, you have um, uh, given uh, to me uh, just, um, uh, just a few um, uh, proposals. First of all, it seems to be clear for me that Europe uh, has to revisit all its defense policies. In Germany, we have spent too little for defense for many, many years. That was a consequence of the enormous cost uh, of German unification, three billion, uh, three thousand 
billion uh, euro uh, and the cost of energy transition that is underway for more than uh, uh, two decades uh, in my country. Uh, we have um, to uh, discuss uh, when we increase military spendings, uh, how to use it, how to organize it. Would we able, would we be able uh, to, um, to respond to aggression uh, from uh, outside uh, EU and NATO? Uh, would we be in a position to defend ourselves uh, without um, recurring to um, the um, atomic nuclear threat? Uh, when I was a soldier uh, in compulsory military service in the German army um, almost, um, almost uh, 45 years ago, um, uh, then we were told, oh no, we, we, we do not have uh, to have that capability to, to defend ourselves. We have the nuclear deterrence. And now we see that conventional wars are becoming uh, uh, possible again at a scale that we never, never uh, uh, expected uh, to happen. We will have to discuss in this context energy, uh, energy supply. And um, I, um, I'm, very, I'm very much impressed when I see that people say, oh, you are dependent of Russia. Please end the dependency from Russia. Yes, of course. Um, but um, the point is that Germany has been energy dependent um, for um, 70 years now, during all its history. 70% of our primary energy consumption uh, is imported. Nuclear elements, oil, gas, and coal. The only thing we are producing in Germany is renewable energies and soft coal. Uh, that is the situation. It means we will always be energy dependent. And even when the ecological transformation will succeed, countries, densely populated countries like Germany, uh, and others in Europe will remain dependent, especially because Germany is still a largely exporting country. We are producing the goods from many countries in the world, and this is energy intensive. Uh, and therefore, we have to say, well, if we substitute so-called dependence from Russia, will we then accept dependence on Qatar or states in the Gulf region instead? Or do we uh, rely in the future, uh, what the Trump administration always wanted us to do, uh, on shell gas from the US? Um, I, have, I have no doubt that, that we can trust our American allies. Uh, but my green climate activists are pretending all the time uh, that shell gas um, is more damaging to the climate than even soft coal or hard coal would be. So in Germany, nuclear energy is not accepted. It has been the, um, the founding myth of, mythos uh, of, the, of the Green Party to end nuclear energy. It was decided twice. Um, and in 2011, by a large majority in parliament, um, and that means um, the question is, we, we still have three uh, remaining power plants, uh, that's not so much uh, to build new ones. Look at France, look at the United Kingdom, look at Finland, to build new ones takes more than 20 years. So the point is, the point is, what will be our answer short term? When I was dealing with um, renewable energies and energy transition as a minister of the environment, 10 years ago in the Chancellery uh, and as a Minister for Energy and Economy the last four years. Um, then I was convinced I would have, or we would have a solution. Uh, we would say, okay, many, many uh, renewable energies, what we cannot uh, 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 produce in our own country because it is too small, too densely populated, we can produce uh, in, in neighboring countries like Ukraine, like Poland, we can produce it in Australia and Canada and import it as a green hydrogen. We was were the first European country having a green hydrogen strategy. But green hydrogen will become an alternative in 10 years' time uh, when it comes to quantities. 
um, and uh, gas has become expensive and we are dependent. That is something that we have to discuss. And then we have coal. Uh, and uh, I already mentioned that this is seen as one of the most uh, uh, dangerous uh, climate um, 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 uh, 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 climate problems um, at all. So we, what we need is a European consensus on it. Uh, in the convention where I worked with um, John Putin, I remember that my red-green coalition government of Chancellor Schroeder at the time was vigorously against a joint European energy policy for one simple reason. It, um, they wanted to switch off the nuclear power plants, and therefore we said the energy mix is up to each country concerned. But can we implement the Green Deal? by just accepting that every country is implemented its own energy policy. And this brings me to my next uh, thesis. Um, we have decided the Green Deal two years ago. It was an enormous step and it was a successful step. Uh, today, the US, Canada, Australia, Japan, and South Korea have uh, committed to the same objective and goal uh, and aim to end um, um, CO2 emissions by 2050. Germany has even um, um, uh, uh, been, uh, as uh, sometimes happens, a little bit more ambitious. We have decided last year that we will come to an end by 2045. Uh, and that means this energy transition, this climate transition, this Green Deal is of utmost importance. And my thesis is no single European state has already a concept, a strategy, and a timetable on how to achieve the um, 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 uh, consecutive steps that are necessary. Uh, when I had a debate as a minister last summer uh, with um, a, um, a gas supplier uh, in the big cities, Gazak in Berlin, most of the um, apartments uh, are heated by gas. And then I said, oh, what are you going to do? Because natural gas is not an alternative and green hydrogen will be very expensive. The answer was, oh, we are now starting experiments. We will look how this and this work. I said, okay, but you have a city of almost 3 million people. You have hundreds of thousands of flats and apartments and, uh, and buildings. Um, uh, you have to be ready before 2045. Did you ever realize what that means? Um, uh, you have to, to, to renew the entire infrastructure uh, to replace one by another. And this is something that will be the case uh, in Italy, uh, in the Netherlands, um, in Poland, uh, in all the European countries, where we're serious about energy transition and climate protection and Green Deal. Yes, we are. We were serious when we decided it. That was at least my uh, conviction. I would perhaps not have been uh, that ambitious. Uh, we had the climate targets as a European Union um, before, a um, little bit less ambitious, eight, minus 80% by 2050. But that was an enormous, an enormous difference between 80 and 100% reduction. You have not 20% gap. The gap is huge and immense because the higher hanging fruits are the most difficult fruits to be harvested. And therefore it will cost a lot of, a lot of money, a lot of uh, uh, GDP. We have to strengthen our economies. We have uh, to make sure that uh, Europe remains competitive, that Europe remains an industrial power. Uh, and that requires uh, a lot of um, progress in the area of digitization, uh, internet of things, um, the, the normal machinery, the normal industrial products um, and industrial machines can no longer uh, be uh, used without advanced digital technology. Uh, and therefore, I have tabled an industrial strategy as a minister in my country. I was heavily criticized uh, by parts of the German uh, business sector. Uh, I had to defend myself. Uh, today, we have a European industrial strategy, fortunately, and we have realized that Europe has to be become, in a certain way, um, uh, in a, um, uh, in a technologically 
they're independent. What does it mean? It does not mean autonomy. We are living in an interconnected, interdependent global economy more than ever. Uh, but Europe uh, will have to make sure from the production of uh, medical face masks uh, uh, and battery cells and uh, semiconductors and microprocessors um, to other sensitive products, we have to make sure that uh, Europe still is and remains uh, one of the strongest economic uh, uh, regions uh, worldwide. And we have to answer a geostrategic question. I will not answer it. I will just ask it. And the geostrategic question is, what countries do we consider in the future as our friends? And uh, which ones do we consider as our enemies? Um, I know that um, uh, because I have, I have um, uh, dealt with so many European, Eastern European governments in Poland, in Ukraine, in the Baltic states. And when I argued at the beginning of my political career that Russia has to become a democracy because democracies are not aggressive uh, in 99% in of the cases at least, uh, and you can rely on a democracy, and that is the best peace guarantee for all of us. Then I was contradicted uh, by Vitautas Landsbergis, by my friends in Ukraine and others, um, who suffered uh, for more than 40 years under communist uh, uh, oppression. And they said, oh no, it was not communism, it was Russia. Russia is evil. You, will you may never trust Russia. Um, and this was a substantial, a substantial um, uh, 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 di 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 um, divergence between some of the countries in Western Europe uh, with freedom and democracy uh, after the war, the Second World War, and others in Eastern Europe suffering from communist and Soviet uh, oppression. And then the next point is, what about China? What about India? What about the US? What about the Gulf region? Um, and um, I know there are people in think tanks um, very concerned about a possible new block emerging between Russia, China, um, and uh, India. Uh, it, China would have the technological capacities, Russia the raw materials and the energy, and India uh, the workforce, the labor force. Uh, if and when you look at the reactions uh, on our decisions in the Ukrainian war now, then it is interesting to see how reluctant India and China are behaving. Uh, three or four years ago, in the Trump administration, the biggest enemy was China. Can we afford as Ireland, as France, as Germany, uh, to say, okay, it is China and India and Russia and perhaps the United States if Mr. Trump is re-elected uh, in three years time. I'm not so sure. Um, responsible politics means that you have to decide on cooperation, that you have to decide on alliances, that you have to make choices. These choices cannot be made by politicians alone. We need your advice. We need your expertise. And that is something that cannot wait until the next crisis, the crisis will arrive, we have to discuss it as soon as the hot war in Ukraine is over. Finally and lastly, I'm not pessimistic, I'm optimistic. The European Union is still the best functioning um, economic uh, integration model the world has ever seen. We have managed to survive Brexit. We have managed to survive the Euro crisis. We have managed to uh, to create and um, to, to, to have uh, the single market in an impressive way. And even if Ireland uh, is, not, um, uh, 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 is in, a, in a very spe specific situation for many, many years with its borders with the UK, uh, we have uh, implemented the Schengen area uh, very successfully. And, um, the, um, and, and uh, we have uh, the Euro uh, we have so many, so many benefits from that. Uh, and I think we have to, um, to remind ourselves 
the strengths and the successes of the past in order to define the areas of action for the future. And the last point, please discuss once again decision-making processes in EU. They are excellent, but they are much too slow. And the European Union is not capable for what we call uh, in, uh, in computer language multitasking. If always one problem that is consuming, eating up all our attention uh, in the European Council, COVID-19, the Euro crisis, the Green Deal, now it is Ukraine. But we will have to be able to deal with four or five challenges at a time. Otherwise, we can achieve something, but possibly too late and too little. And that would be not in the interest of the Irish people, of the German people, and any other people in Europe. And therefore, thank you for all your valuable work. Thank you for your attention. And I'm now looking forward to your questions.